The New Mexico Museum of Art is working in partnership with the School for Advanced Research to present a series of public programs honoring our shared history. This year marks the centennial celebration of the Museum of Art. Last year marked SAR's 110th anniversary, and this year is the 40th anniversary of the Indian Arts Research Center in SAR. These presentations, of which this is the last, I believe, uh, are supported by the New Mexico Humanities Council, whose mission is to enhance the civic and cultural life of the citizens of New Mexico. The New Mexico Humanities Council encourages and supports the humanities by seeking out and funding quality humanities programs for presentation to and participation by diverse public audiences throughout New Mexico. Thought, learning, and experience must be shared. This is what, the, this is what it means to be human. We're grateful to the New Mexico Humanities Council and its pr uh, principal funder, the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the sustained commitment of its board of directors. And now I have to give this disclaimer. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the, New the National Endowment of the Humanities or the New Mexico Humanities Council. So, you've been warned. Uh, and now I would just like to acknowledge uh, a few people. I'd like to acknowledge the New Mexico Humanities Council for providing grants to fund this program. I'd like to acknowledge the School for Advanced Research for their partnership in, planning and presentation, in the planning and presentation of these programs, including Michael F. Brown, President, Laura Sullivan, and Isis Bennett. I'd like to acknowledge the staff here at the New Mexico Museum of Art, including Rebecca Aubin, Chris Nail, Mary Scully, and our director, Mary Kershaw. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs. And I also just want to make a plug <laughs> that the programs, uh, these programs are all related to um, the material that's on view right now in our galleries and our Centennial Exhibition Horizon. So if you haven't had a chance to check that exhibition out, um, I suggest that you do so today. It'll be coming down in November. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce Michael Brown, President of the School for Advanced Research, who will be, in turn, introducing Brian Bayou. Thanks, Christian. He's, he's done, done the heavy lifting. I don't have to disclaim anything. Um, my, my job is simply to welcome you on behalf of the staff and board of directors of the School for Advanced Research. Uh, this panel discussion, as Christian explained, is part of a series of talks to celebrate the centennial of the Museum of Art and SAR's long relationship with the museum. Today's panel discussion will be moderated by Brian Vio, who is director of the Indian Arts Research Center at SAR, as many of you know. Brian's a member of the Pueblo of Acoma, attended New Mexico State University, and has served as Acoma's lieutenant governor, among other distinctions. Brian was the founding director of the Acoma Museum at Acoma. He's also an accomplished painter Potter and Weaver. Please join me in welcoming Brian Bay. What's we hope? Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this final presentation of this series. Uh, and thank you to the New Mexico Museum of Art for this great partnership. It's, uh, it's been a really, really great partnership and I look forward to our continued work together. So, when I pulled out my paperwork, I realized that I didn't pull some pieces from my printer. But, we're going to proceed anyway because I have an awesome memory. <laughs> or we'll see, we'll see. <clears throat> I just want to first um, say that um, when I think about the weaving tradition among the Pueblo people, I'm always reminded of a conversation that my great aunt and great uncle had one day, one evening sitting around the dinner table at the home of my great grandfather. And my, uh, the, what sparked the conversation was my great aunt 
um, talking about a particular um, event that was going to happen at Akama. And she grew very emotional about the event because of a particular uh, garment that um, the family had its in, in its possession for quite a, long, a while and that at some point um, went missing. And um, it was interesting that, you know, as this conversation was happening, and of course the conversation was happening in Ak the Akama language, and uh, I was sitting there just thinking about and, and imagining this garment as she was describing it. And um, she, what made her, um, I think, spark that uh, joy in, in, in her again during this conversation was she was talking about how small this garment was and it was a, a, a maiden shawl and um, that was um, made by her uncle who was a weaver and um, she talked about how the uncle um, would go to Zuni Pueblo to visit a, a, a good friend of his and who was introducing him to other uh, weaving techniques. And so this particular um, piece was um, representative of those teachings that he was acquiring uh, every time he went to Zuni. And so the Maiden's Cape had three or four, she recollects, different styles of weaving. And the, the, there were patches of indigo mixed in with the black um, uh, wool that, that was used in, in the garment. Not too long ago, um, the School for Advanced Research, uh, I, I guess this was last year, the School for Advanced Research organized a field trip out to Akuma. And uh, it was during our feast day on September 2nd. And uh, the following day, we had the opportunity to visit the Sky City Cultural Center and Agu Museum. And those individuals who participated in that field trip had the opportunity to see this garment. Because what happened after that conversation and around the dinner table uh, occurred, we, uh, the family, busy themselves with trying to figure out where in, in the heck this garment uh, may have uh, gone to. And, and so everyone was going through their collections of, and, uh, you know, uh, of, of garments and, and other materials um, that were in the hands of the family. Um, and it eventually turned up. And it turned up with it was in a wooden box, a painted wooden box that was in my paternal grandmother's um, storage room. And it was wrapped in a buckskin, painted buckskin, um, um, painted buckskin. <laughs> and um, my paternal grandmother, her name was Awana, um, was so excited to, to discover the piece. And it wasn't in the best condition because the storeroom had a leak. The leak happened to impact the, um, the wooden box, which also then impacted the contents of that box. So it, was, it was, uh, had many stains uh, on it, and, um, but it, was, it, didn't, it didn't matter at that point. It was, it was uh, back in the hands of the family, and everyone was, was, so, was so happy about it. And by then, this, the, the event that I mentioned earlier had taken place and had passed. But my paternal grandmother was uh, very um, uh, careful about taking care of this, this piece, uh, this, this shawl. And she would um, wear it uh, for different ceremonies. But she, she would only wear it for a few minutes before putting on uh, the garment that she would use in, in a ceremony. And 
you know, I mentioned earlier that the joy that, that, that was, um, uh, came upon my uh, great aunt because she, she recalls this, uh, uh, what my grandmother would do. And she, she laughed and said, oh, uh, she saying in Akmer said, if you wish me to, in no time, you go, to you, my mom, it drew and laughing, she said, she said, oh, that one, I, I, I don't know why she would always make a point to wear this. It's so small and she's so big, you know. <laughs> but nevertheless, my grandmother took great pride in, in being the caretaker of that, that garment. And um, in, in 2006, when the Alto Museum opened in Acoma Pueblo, I was then the director of the museum. We curated an exhibit called Sleepbook and Master, or the Cotton Girls. And this exhibition was um, very important to the community. It was important because the weaving tradition at Acoma has been lost, and it's been lost for quite some time. And while there was great interest among the community to develop this exhibit, there wasn't a whole lot of information or people to draw from um, about this tradition. We heard some incredible stories, and thankfully many of our tribal members and elders were willing to share. And thankfully, a lot of our tribal members came forward with their own private collections of old, older Akama textiles for the exhibit including my family, which uh, donated that small maiden shawl for the exhibit. And that same shawl remains in the collections at the Alco Museum, and the SAR, folks from SAR field trip had the opportunity to see it. So, I, I'm, I'm sharing this with you because of that uh, experience that I had at Acoma with my family, but also with the development of the exhibit. We learned at Akma that a lot of the words associated with the weaving tradition, the prayers, the songs, were lost. Or only portions of them a few people knew about. But we also were um, told and informed by our elders and cultural leaders at that time of, of thinking about the exhibit that we needed to proceed with caution because this was a very sensitive um, uh, tradition, uh, very, the information that only a few people had access to um, and that the society of men who were the weavers were the caretakers of, of that knowledge and uh, were no longer around, and so as we were asking and making inquiries about this lost art, um, we, we learned um, a lot about the families and the makers, the men of those societies, but also learned a tremendous amount <coughs> excuse me, from the women of those families who were the embroiderers who were the, um, uh, the lucky ones to wear these garments and who are today the caretakers of those garments. So this tradition in Akamo in particular is rooted in, a, uh, in our own Akamo culture um, and history. Um, and it, you know, when we talk about weaving, we have to make reference to the deities and the people within the spirit world who uh, helped to make this, um, this art form possible. And so I begin with that story and I'm going to begin with, just want to share this, this, this statement um, for all of us to think about. So the, my, the emergence, migration, and settlement of ancestral Pueblo people is rooted in prayer, song, and an intimate connection to the spirit world. Creator provided what was essential for the migration to be successful, 
and with a deep understanding and respect for the sacred environment that our ancestors treaded. They created the technology to create essential tools, clothing, utilitarian wares, and ceremonial materials needed to sustain their early lives on this earth. Today, it is through prayer and song that we recall the time of creation and migration to our present day Pueblos, and we continuously call upon Creator and the spirit world for blessings and guidance as we all work so much harder to sustain our ancestral way of life in this new time. So some of you might ask why I begin today's panel presentation with such a statement. And I say this because of the sacredness of the topic we will discuss and its roots to the time of creation. And while these stories vary from one Pueblo to the next, including our brothers and sisters in Hopi, we acknowledge that the talent bestowed on the weavers and other textile artists is not by chance or choice, rather a blessing and oftentimes a talent prescribed to a life even before it's born. The Pueblo textile tradition has been studied by many scholars, collectors, and artists them themselves to better understand the complexity of the art form. For Pueblo people, there is a great interest to know more about this history and of the weaving and embroidery traditions. This is even more apparent today as only a few Hopi and Pueblo people are active weavers in the traditional form. And while there are a large number of embroidery artists in the Pueblos today, many are also interested in gaining access to collections in order to better understand design, placement, technique, and materials. So today, as we reflect on this gift of the Creator, this art form, and the materials that were used in the very early times to create garments and ceremonial attire and other materials. I've, I feel like we've been very blessed um, to see that this tradition continues, that we are still very interested in knowing more about this tradition and that in doing so, and in making the inquiry, we fulfill our inherent responsibility to ensure that we are creating these garments and ceremonial materials for, to sustain our life into the future. And I am very, very honored that we can have three Pueblo textile artists join us today to talk more about these ideas and to delve a little more into their own experiences from their respective communities and also talk about what's happened over time and this creative spirit really evolving to um, what it is today. There is a resurgence, there is, a, there is some um, uh, there is a revitalization of this particular art form that's happening, and it's happening in many different ways in, in various communities. But I think we can all be very grateful that these artists and craftspeople remain committed to this art form and are talking to one another, are experimenting, and calling upon the ancestors every time as they sit at their loom, as they pick up their needle, or, and as they gift one of their creations to um, another person. So with that, I want to introduce our panelists and invite them to join me on stage. Would you go ahead and come on up, the three of you?
By the way, I found the page that I thought I left in my printer. <laughs> So I'll begin with Mr. Louis Garcia. Mr. Louis Garcia came to SAR as a 2012 Ronald and Susan Dubin Native Artist Fellow. Louis is Tiwa and Piro Pueblo from the Piro Manso Tui Tiwa tribe of Guadalupe Pueblo in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Louis holds a BA in biology and Spanish and a master's degree in language literacy and sociocultural education. Taught the art of weaving by his grandfather, Garcia understands the importance of passing on his skills to future generations. In addition to being a full-time classroom teacher, Louis dedicates much of his free time towards offering instruction to Pueblo people who have an interest in the traditional style of Pueblo weaving. While at SAR, Louis completed a full or a wool plaid blanket woven in the traditional diamond and diagonal tool patterns, very similar to historic blankets that are in the collection. As in all his weaving, Louis pr processed the natural hand-spun churro wool yarns and colored them with natural dyes. Louis teaches weaving at the Indian Public Cultural Center in Albuquerque, at Santa Clara Pueblo, and other institutions throughout the so Southwest. And Louis believes that, quote, through my weaving, I remember my ancestors. I am grateful for the legacy they have left me and my hope is to see that this legacy continues to be appreciated and that future generations of public people will carry on this ancient tradition." End quote. Mrs. Isabel Gonzalez is from Jemez Pueblo. Isabel is an award-winning textile artist, and Isabel has a long history with the Indian Arts Research Center at SAR and has contribute, contributed greatly towards the documentation of the collection and the research associated with the Pueblo Textile Collection. Isabel was a key participant in the Pueblo Textile Symposium that was hosted by SAR in 2009. When Isabel was, uh, was a child in Jemez Pueblo, she would herd sheep near the small Spanish town of San Isidro. She says, quote, there were a lot of butterflies over there, and when my sister and brother and I were herding the sheep and waiting, We'd be over there catching butterflies, all different colors, catching them and, telling them and letting them go. And since then, I've always liked butterflies." <laughs> End quote. Later, Gonzalez chose the butterfly as her sign signature symbol on the traditional mantas she embroiders. Isabel learned to embroider from watching her mother, Loretta Cajero, who learned embroidery at the Santa Fe Indian School. When she was in the fifth grade, Isabel entered an embroidered pillow at the New Mexico State Fair and won first prize. Isabel places great emphasis on the proper preparation of materials and execution of design on various traditional Pueblo garments. Isabel's creations are found in many private Pueblo collections and are worn proudly during social dances, feast days, and ceremony. Isabel is married and lives at uh, into and is and lives at San Ildefonso Pueblo, where she has lived and taught embroidery for to many tribal members. She is a longtime instructor at the Poe Cultural Center in Pewaukee Pueblo, and Isabel states, quote, My intention is to teach the basic embroidery so that it can go on from generation to generation. I want other people to learn and carry it on. End quote. Mr. Eric Chapito is a 2010 Rollin and Mary Ellikeen Artist Fellow and one of the few weavers practicing in Zuni Pueblo today. As a result, he strongly believes in perfecting his weaving techniques and passing on his knowledge to future generations. Eric received his AFA in Museum Studies from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Eric, like, his, like Isabel and Louis, is an award-winning artist constantly challenging his skills and techniques. Eric and his sons are known for weaving traditional Pueblo garments as well as blankets inspired by the ancestors, making blankets from rabbit fur and turkey feathers. Eric has served as a weaving instructor at the Ashiwi Awan Museum and Heritage, Heritage Center in Zuni Pueblo, and is a frequent demonstrator at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque. 
Eric says of his experience at SAR, quote, while I did my fellowship at the School for Advanced Research, it took me a t time, it took me to a time, excuse me, when, I, when weaving was so rich and alive, a time when it seemed the weaving would never die and weaving had strong roots. I spent countless hours looking in shock and admiration at my own people's weaving abilities. This experience made me work harder to perfect my own weaving abilities. Please welcome me in joining the art, uh, in welcoming the artist. So, and if you could share with us your own, uh, about your own influences and uh, anyone from your community or your family who influenced your um, uh, career as a textile artist? Okay, she like it, you know, I was going to get some let on half of Kakos, you know, the Jimmy Ganitan for now on half of it. Lena Kasa Paki Awashena on Lena Hotel. My name is um, Eric Tapito. I am from the Pueblo of Zuni. And I am a uh, five generation artisan, but I was kind of the oddball out of the family. Uh, we come from a long line of silversmiths, and I decided to struggle with string. <coughs> but at the time of creation, it does talk about our ancestors within the four underworlds of uh, our Mother Earth, um, utilizing plant fibers, um, creating different types of tapestries and kwahosha. Bilanaka les awashenaka. So it talks about that uh, continuously. Um, and as time progressed on and we moved on to the surface of the earth and we migrated to the place of Itiwana, where we live currently today, those uh, processes faded in time. Um, and an insurgence in the 70s when the Zuni tribe decided to take over the Zuni Public School District, they decided at that point to go ahead and uh, add that into their curriculum. And so from the 70s, uh, there's been uh, weavers added to the continuance of this uh, precious art form. And 26 years ago, in an art class, is where I actually learned how to weave. They taught the basics of how to weave those tapestries in that particular class. And from there, it extended on to creating different techniques on my own. And that's the process that most Pueblo weavers today um, learn how to weave is through trial and error and going through collections and struggling continuously without any mentors to go through. Um, the plain floated work technique is the only technique that's taught in Zooming. And so all the other techniques I had to learn on my own. And so going through collections and doing my internship when I was at the Institute of American Indian Arts, uh, going through the collections at SAR, extended my grasp on wanting to learn different techniques and motivated me to push to um, try different avenues, but all of the techniques that are used and utilized uh, within the Southwest are native to this area and they've got no European influence whatsoever in regards to the techniques itself, but there's been countless documentations about the tapestries that were done in Zuni and the process in which uh, they were, done, they were uh, created. But what most people don't realize is that Pueblo Textiles was a communal project. It was done by a community and a group of men. But as time progressed on, we started to do it individually. And to this day, we are individual weavers now and not a collaboration as we used to be. But uh, the downside to all of that is that all of the techniques that all of us possess up here uh, they're fading with time, and the real struggle that we face is 
when you outweigh the cost of creating a piece and the time it takes and you add in all those factors. Financially, this isn't a sound job to do. And when I was at the Institute of American Indian Arts and I sat down for my first Museum 101 class, the instructor walks in and says, well, if you're here to create, if you're here to make a lot of money, you're in the wrong place and there's the door. And so that's the case with tapestries. Um, financially, it's not sound, and so my wife, uh, she has the real job. She's an accounts manager, and I stay home and play with string. <laughs> Same thing? Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. Okay, again, at the end of the table, table no, but uh, why am I? Thank you very much for inviting me. <clears throat> you know, my name is Isabel Gonzalez, and I'm from the Pueblo of Jemez, Wawatoa. And um, for history, I have a quote that Joe Sandel, our Jemez historian, had quoted. The Pueblo are an ancient people where history goes back into the farthest, which is a time. And that's exactly what we're teaching about, thinking about. We have come a long ways from the time that our ancestors um, did what we're doing now. I've um, gone through a lot of books, going through the at times when I think about how Hamish people um, reach out to, to um, teach other people or how they were taught. I think about textiles in the museum, how that individual maybe taught themselves or who taught them how to do it. You know, it's a lot of uh, thinking that I go through. I have my, uh, my mom that taught me how, and then my her mom that maybe she taught her too, but which I don't know myself, you know. And um, it takes a lot to do what we're doing. Uh, we vision our designs, and then we think about the technical things, the mistakes we go through, and I'm doing it. It takes a lot of work. It time-consuming job. And. Um, uh, what I, Eric said, you know, my mission, I t try to teach the basics so that my work can be carried on. And, um, and what we put on our cloth, that's a lifetime design that will be kept in the museums or collectors, whoever um, buy them from us, you know. I have my own daughter that I taught and she does a little bit. And, uh, but most of my family, I'm the only one that took up what I'm doing now. I come from a big family, but they have other stuff that they're into, you know, mostly education. And, um, but for what I do, you know, it, it, it's a long, long timing work that I do. And it takes a lot to, to, to have patience. You really have to sit down and do it. And very time consuming, like I said. So, thank you. Hina mm -hmm. um, good evening. I'd like to also um, thank Brian for the invitation to come and share some of um, my experiences with my work as a Pueblo Fiber artist. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Albuquerque. Uh, my grandfather was um, 
born in Las Cruces in the Tiwa um, community there in Las Cruces, which is uh, a sister village of um, Isleta Pueblo and um, Isleta del Sur down in El Paso. And many of us are related between those villages and uh, we have a long history um, stretching from long before the Pueblo Revolt, but um, most of our communities, most of us were um, refugees, Pueblo refugees that were taken south as captives by the Spanish. So there's a long, really long history there that, that goes back, but um, the reason why I mention that is because um, in some of my research that I've done looking at some of the early Spanish documents, I see that some of the first descriptions of Pueblo textiles that were ever recorded were by the Spanish. And one of the first things that they mentioned was the vast cotton fields that they saw as they came into Pueblo country. And um, these fields were the fields of my ancestors, the Tiwa, the Tiwa they call Tiwesh or Tiwa, and Piro people of uh, the, what's called the Rio Abajo, or the uh, southern New Mexico area, which is south of um, Albuquerque, down to the El Paso, and even uh, Juarez, Mexico. And um, so some of the first descriptions of the textiles that the people were wearing at this time of first contact were um, in, is in these Spanish documents. And um, similar to Acoma and several other pueblos, at one point the textile tradition was completely lost in, um, the, along the Rio Grande pueblos. And there's many um, reasons for that, mainly being the um, uh, drastic drought and the uh, demands of Spanish tribute during the time of um, colonization put, just pushed our people over the edge. Uh, and so it, it became um, survival mode at that point. Um, pickings were slim, um, people were starving, and uh, we had the um, Spanish uh, tribute that we had to meet, and then also the uh, various um, uh, nomadic groups that were also um, trying to scratch out an existence in a place of uh, little. So there, were, there was a lot going on during that time. Many of our people in our villages scattered to other, other pueblos, including Hopi and um, Isleta, Laguna, and even um, Mr. Sando, who was mentioned um, earlier, spoke of um, some of even some of the the songs that were uh, that are used um, in a language that is foreign to the Towa language. Um, we suspect that some of those songs um, come from our our Pito language. So we. That history is still very much a part of our oral tradition in terms of um, as um, Southern uh, Pueblo people and um, as myself having learned from my grandfather um, the very basics of weaving. I kind of took it from there because uh, being born and raised here in Albuquerque, my grandpa had many um, bebas, many um, God, God relatives, God parents, um, in many of the villages. So we would go and and um, watch the dance, and so I always had, you know, that spark interest and, and appreciation for the textiles that were used in the various ceremonies that were going on, and I, I always had a curiosity. It always piqued my interest, always um, to look at those um, textiles and always wonder where they were how they were made and how come we didn't see people making them anymore. Um, so for me, that was really kind of my uh, inspiration. And later as I, um, as I grew up and went through my education in the profession, my professional world, I'm, a, I'm an educator, um, I started stretching out and researching more and meeting, talking to people and meeting other people and, um, archaeologists 
And um, so now uh, I had the opportunity to uh, mentor with um, Dr. Lori Webster, who is in the audience tonight. Thank you for coming. And um, part of our work that we've been involved with within the last um, two, three years now has been to document um, uh, perishables, um, perishable materials such as textiles, uh, yucca sandals, and any, anything perishable in nature, and document um, the collections from the Four Corners area um, in various different institutions. So I was asked to, to be on this uh, research committee as a cultural consultant to look at some of this material and document this material. And this experience has just really um, grounded my experience and just my inspiration has gone through the roof about um, as I learn more about this um, prehistoric and prehistoric uh, material that goes uh, as far back into um, the basket maker period, which were our um, our ancestors um, from the, of the Pueblo people. So, you know, having that rare opportunity to be able to go through the drawers in these institutions and look at material that's, you know, 1,000, 2,000 years old and be able to, to see the contrast, okay, what, what has continued, what has persisted through time and what has um, died out and um, just kind of gives me a whole new appreciation for um, for that, and so much of my work and inspiration comes from seeing to it that our tradition continue, and even if it's just bringing back a little wisp of what our ancestors had a long time ago, then that will be um, enough for me. Thank you. So, <clears throat> Louis, thank you for uh, talking about research and the collections of Pueblo textiles that exist in various um, institutions. Uh, because I, you know, uh, I'll admit that anytime I'm on a trip to another institution, um, one of the first things I ask to see are the Pueblo textiles that they have in, in the collection. And I'm always excited to um, just view and interact with, with these uh, textiles, many of them that are in a forum that are no longer made in our communities. And, um, you know, the, the Met in New York is preparing to open an exhibit next week um, and where there is a, uh, a black Akama, uh, what was labeled as a manta, uh, in, that was slated for display and will be on display. But we had a conversation about uh, the fact that this was not a mountain. It was not a dress. Maybe it was at one point. And then it was embellished with the, you know, the this beautiful um, red and indigo embroidery. And, and that it was no longer a mountain. It was no longer a dress, but it was used as a cape. And so um, the collectors, <laughs> private collectors, were. Uh, challenging me on changing the, 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 the description. Um, so we agreed that we would call it both a dress and a, or a manta and a shawl, be, or cape, because it was probably used as both. So my question for, the, for, for you all is, and Louis, you've already talked about kind of the influence of you know, your research and your exposure to these types of collections. But I guess I would like for you all to talk a little bit about, uh, in particular with, with, um, with uh, uh, Isabel and Eric, about revitalizing some of the uh, earlier uh, ancestral forms of textiles. Uh, Eric and his sons are, and he can talk more about this, but are, are, have been creating uh, beautiful rabbits, rabbit fur blankets, and blankets of feathers. And I'd, I'd like to ask you to talk a little more about that and where that inspiration came from. And, and Isabel, with um, all the work that you've done on SAR, you're probably the most familiar with the public collection at, at SAR, but I'd um, like for you to talk a little bit about how those collections at SAR have inspired your work. Mm. 
Yes, uh, <clears throat> the collections, the pieces that I have at SAR are very important in our villages, not for only Jemez, but different pueblos. We all share the same uh, textiles, the mantas, the kilt, sashes, but in Jemez, uh, when I was growing up, my mom had told me to use the same patterns, the same colors, don't use any colors, different colors, like bright colors. I said, we're, the way, our way of life is we stay traditional. So I kept that up. I do a lot of uh, textiles with the deeper colors. Only when I'm asked to do a certain color, then I'll do it. But most of my work is all traditional patterns. And I use a lot of, um, um, like Eric said, I love butterflies. As you can tell, I'm wearing butterfly necklace, <laughs> butterfly earrings. <laughs> my house is full of butterflies, <laughs> and uh, but that's my trademark. I use a lot of that on my uh, mantas, and I um, also uh, like to share um, my experiences of what I have done. I, um, my auntie and um, had um, a sample that her daughter did a long time ago, and she gave me her sample. And she lost her daughter at a young age, and she did that sample when she was going to school at the Indian school. And she gave that to me so that I can, ha I can carry the designs of her work uh, and share to my family. So most of the time, I'll do a little bit of her work, but most likely, I tend to do my own designs that I normally don't have patterns for. I um, start and then um, what comes into my head is what sold on the material of the claw. And um, it takes a lot, like I said, you know, to your vision and then your technical, your planning, everything. And it's, it it's, um, uh, comes from my heart of what's put on top so that it'll be carried on from generations to generations. If people want to um, see my work, they can go to the SAR or different museums to see what I've done. I sometimes do stuff which surprises me. I go back and say, did I do that, you know? So it's what's put on cloth. It's what represents a lot of our travel um, designs, like the rain, the rain clouds, the, um, the evening, the morning sun, the evening sun, our cable step designs, our four directions, uh, the mountains that I do, the diamonds represents the water jugs, and the uh, feathers that we use during our ceremonial. And it gives me great pleasure to see my work that I've done uh, dancing out in the different pueblos, what they're using, you know. It, it takes a lot 
uh, for me to take in sometimes I get <laughs> sometimes I get emotional <laughs> to you know because it takes a lot <clears throat> and then I also um, um, ask my um, spiritual guide uh, the ones that are gone to help me out when I'm doing big stuff like that, like mantas. So that's what I wanted to share. Don't mind us, we get emotional about our work. look at those as weavers, we're very humble and we're constantly praying, spinning the yarn, carding, getting all the processes ready, the setup, to the weaving process. And that's what we're constantly doing and we're constantly praying. And if we don't feel that energy on our parts, we put the project aside and move to something else. So, but that's what we're always taught. In order for us to expand on the different techniques and the styles that have gone extinct, uh, we rely on collections. And so I was uh, asked to recategorize the Zumi collection in the National Museum in Washington. And we went through and they took out specific ones that they wanted to see. And then um, they took me through the different cabinets. And then after that, it was a free for all. It was my choice to go through wherever I wanted. And each drawer I pulled out, there were significant things that were taken from our village. And the biggest thing I stumbled across was a rabbit blanket that was um, created about 112 years ago. That was collected in Zumi when the Frederick Hodge expedition was in Zumi, uh, excavating our sister village of Hawiku. And it was taken. Uh, they actually had two of their collections. Uh, and the Bronx Museum took one, and the National Museum in Washington took the other. And so I stumbled across it, and I opened it up, and I looked through, and I was able to see the different techniques. And so each village has their own style of embroidery. They have their own style of weave, and the designs are all significant. And so when you go through collections, you can actually designate through the designs and the techniques of what village it came from. And with that in mind, um, they wove together, and all of the rabbit blankets are all finger techniques, and there's no actual true weave to that particular process. Um, they had gone and used wool to create the piece, and they ran out of wool, and so they decided to use um, cotton broadcloth, and with using the cotton broadcloth, it expanded the, um, the braid and it allowed me to see how this particular blanket was made. And so on my journey back home, I sat my son down and I asked him, do you want to tackle this project I have? I said, but um, it's going to be a lot of work. And he agreed with me and we um, harvested 21 of those furs ourselves, tanned and hide, and that was such a tedious process. It took about 21 days just to do that whole thing, and so we said, we're going to buy the rest. <laughs> so we went and we cut strips, we sewed them, put it together, we bound it, braided it, warped it, and then he and I worked to do the warp back and forth, and we braided the whole process. And both he and I were getting frustrated because we were getting towards the very, very end and uh, he started yelling at me, I started yelling at him, and I said, well, let's take a little break, I said, but our mission was to finish this about two o'clock <laughs> because it was time for us to move on to a different project. And so we finally finished it, we put it together, and we both sat there exhausted, fur all over our bodies. And I told him, I said, well, we gotta take it off. And we took off the, 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 the bindings to the adjusting bars. And we folded it up and we sat together. And I said, well, we need to complete this whole project. And so we started praying. And I said, you know, you're still young. And I'll give you a little slack. But pray in your own language. Pray what you feel is right for you. And I started praying. 
And with that, we purified ourselves of that particular piece that we made. And just as we've done that, there was pitter patter on the rooftop. And I told my son, I said, you know, you need to take a much enjoyment in this because our people let this tradition go with time. Uh, the last time one was ever produced was a hundred years ago in our village and they've gone extinct that when I talk about rabbit blankets nobody knows what I'm talking about. But they were the mattresses of choice at the time and that's what they slept on. And they covered themselves with the turkey blanket and so I told him take the blanket out and let your ancestors dance in the joy of what we created and the first rain of that evening blessed the blanket. And it's a revitalization of something that's gone, that's lost in time. And, you know, I told him, I said, you know, take pride in that. And I do hope that when you do have children, you teach them this process. And that with that, you know, those things don't fade in time. Just as we allow ourselves to let particular art crafts fade in time. And nobody weaves a cloth anymore. It's easier to go to the fabric shop and get a cloth than embroider on there. Nobody does the kilts in that particular fashion anymore, um, mainly because it's accessible and some people don't have the teachers to teach them on how it's done. But when our children go out, it's much easier to work a nine to five job than to toil over the string because it's tedious work and all of us can attest to not sleeping sometimes and having those sore hands and it's not a job for the week because you have to be pretty strong to endure all the pain that we go through just to get from point A to point B, but it's always a blessing for us and that's why we get emotional. Mm -hmm. And when we send our children off into the world, we send them off so that, you know, and we're agriculturalists by trade, and we always pray for the rain. We always, always ask that you all be blessed with a long life. And so it's never us that we pray for. It's always those that are ahead of us. We pray for them first and we pray for ourselves last. And so it's very humbling as weavers and artisans in the native world. Um, but that's who we are. We always pray for others first and then we put ourselves last in that process. And so our last prayer that we put into our tapestries in our language it says, Kosh deni halo li akamaho ade. So every person has their own wants and needs and desires and so that's why the prayer is said so very vague and so whatever it is that makes yourself whole is what we hope you get blessed upon when we do our tapestries and so it's more or less a catch-all. Whatever we don't mention goes into that last prayer and so that we hope get bestowed upon you when you take these blessings and it also happens in the Kiva and the Plaza we go into our plaza and we dance with these garments and we plant those seeds, spiritual seeds, and we hope those seeds would grow and those blessings will array out into the community. And that way, you know, the, the world itself gets blessed with the rain and the corn, that substance that we need to survive. And that's what these tapestries are all about, is to maintain that balance between nature and us and to always ensure that the rain will continue to come. That was beautifully said, thank you, Eric. Um, and to, to this um, point, um, you know, we, in our various communities, have our own terms for these garments and uh, their use, their uses. And in Akama, um, the women would call their, their, their garments uh, and a man for a male, it's a shawi. And those are so sacred to us, you know, we, they're, they are held in very high regard. You have the opportunity to hand these off to someone else at some point. Um, and sometimes a particular garment may serve, um, like the, the little shawl that I talked about earlier, may serve to be used in a particular ceremony only. And, and so what Eric talked about in terms of you know, we, we adorn ourselves with these garments and 
Uh, and it's not, it isn't, it isn't only a process of, you know, just like daily when we get dressed, you know, we put your clothes on. But there's actually a song associated, you know, from putting your shoes on to attaching your, your, um, your garments and adorning yourself until you're complete. And you're representative of all those things that the symbols represent on these, on these textiles. And you're then equipped to go into the plaza or uh, in, inside a ceremonial chamber to, to then dance. So these are very critical elements to the sustainability of our cultures in this time. And so Louis, I want to ask you if you could talk a little bit about the teaching that you do and your approach to teaching um, the, this tradition. And if you could share with us a little bit about your kind of vision for uh, this particular tradition. Um, some say that there might be, you know, continued loss or maybe resurgence in some of our, in some of our communities. But um, as an active instructor uh, of this form, can you talk a little bit about what you see and what you hear from the various um, students who uh, approach you about preservation of this, this art form? Sure. Um, I've been teaching, uh, I started teaching Pueblo weaving about about 10 years ago now. It started at the um, Indian Pueblo Cultural Center when we put together um, an exhibit called The Gathering of the Clouds, uh, which uh, was on exhibit for a couple of years at the, um, at, in the museum at the Cultural Center. And it was a private collection that was um, on loan from uh, an individual here in Santa Fe. And we, um, it sparked a lot of interest and it kind of grew out, grew out of some of the work that we had begun uh, through the Pueblo Artist Workshop Series out of the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. And um, like I said, I have an edu educational background, so that's my professional training. Um, so it was just kind of natural for me to kind of go over into um, teaching of Pueblo weaving and um, and I kind of look at it as kind of from two different perspectives because um, traditionally as public people um, we kind of uh, learn by watching and, and doing it and it's not like from the western sense of education where you know you study it you read all you can about it and then you know you learn the theory and then you go then you go and learn the practice of it. Um, so it was kind of a little bit of a different shift for me, but because um, textiles is such a, a passion of mine, um, it's something that flowed very naturally for me to, to be able to, to teach my passion with others who shared a similar interest. And uh, I've taught about, about over 200 students um, different, different levels of Pueblo weaving since that time, um, most of whom are uh, Pueblo and Native individuals. And I can say I had students from all the 19 Pueblos of New Mexico, um, including um, Hopi as well, individuals from Hopi. And, um, and what I can say from that experience, is I think it was alluded to earlier, as um, Brian so eloquently stated, that um, weaving is not for everybody. <laughs> and I don't say that in a mean way, and I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but as Brian uh, alluded to earlier, in our culture, in many cultures, but particularly in Pueblo culture, we know that there are certain individuals that have a gift or are predisposition to serve or to practice a particular art, maybe to um, compose songs, maybe to make potteries, maybe to spin, maybe to um, weave. 
Um, but what I can say is that maybe out of um, 200 students that I've had, I can count on one hand how many are continue, have continued in developing their art form and um, taking it to the next level and learning on their own. So I see my job as the instructor, as a teacher, to provide that foundation on the basic level and observe, to watch my students. And I learn, at least my hope is that I learn as much from my students as they do from me. And so as I'm watching them, I'm seeing, and as Eric mentioned, how we toil with strings. And some people work themselves up to the point where they just get themselves into a knot and they can't even work. And others can sit, take a breath, and it becomes a meditative exercise. And I always open that and share that with my students. And then I, invariably I always have some students who say, I thought you said this was supposed to be meditative. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't always work out that way for everybody. But I think at the end of the day, what people take away from my classes and from, from uh, what I have to share with them, if nothing else, is a greater appreciation for the work that we do as Pueblo Fiber artists. And I can and, uh, sit up here and name off all the institutions and all the private collections that my pieces are in, but much more important to me, as Isabel stated, is uh, that I can say that I have textiles in all of the 19 pueblos, and um, and mostly mo most of my textiles are actually um, commissioned um, by individuals from Hopi. And for me, that's a very gratifying uh, accomplishment because that is the original purpose intended for our textiles is to be used by our families and extended families our relatives in other communities so that our prayers for the people to be strong will continue on long into the future and as we breathe new life into this tradition that we pray that it will continue on long before we're gone. This is the same prayer that our ancestors put down long time ago, and here we are today. So I'm very um, blessed and honored to be, play a part in that and to share my responsibility to share some of what I know with individuals who are interested and uh, seeing to it that it does continue. Thank you. Isabel, you're, you're known as one of the master voters in, in Pueblo country right now. <laughs> and uh, I was, during the Indian market, I raced to the textile section to see um, all the beautiful text, Pueblo textiles and Navajo textiles. Um, but I always have to see what Isabel Gonzalez made and entered. And, and she talked about earlier about how she works hard to maintain um, the heinous style, traditional style of embroidery on her garments. And, and every time I race to the tables where the textiles are laid out, I always see that she does, has done just that. Uh, but I also see that her, the, the technology um, that she incorporates into the embroidery it's so, so different and it's, it's just a mastered process that you, you, know, you don't see that on other textiles. And um, one of the things that I noticed during this year's Indian market uh, and the entries of uh, Pueblo textiles or Pueblo embroidery was that there's the very traditional um, examples of textile uh, or, or embroidery but we also have more very contemporary um, uh, embroidery that we see on traditional garments. So I wanted to ask you, Isabel, what you feel about this, and, um, and also about how you feel about appropriation or, or sharing of uh, Pueblo embroidery designs. Um, and I ask this question because you know, we have uh, 
folks from various bubbles who come to see the collections at SAR. And sometimes um, we will have requests to see the Hamas collection uh, by uh, members of other pueblos. And one of the stipulations that uh, we uh, carry out at SAR is upon request of the tribal leadership at Hamas, the textile collection is not to be offered to others. So there's some restrictions. And I, I gather that one of the reasons why is because Hamas wants to protect their own designs um, and keep them within. But I want to ask you if you could share your feelings about this, Isabel, uh, about these changes that you see um, in uh, maybe your own community, but also with other embroiderers from various bubbles. And uh, if you could talk a little bit about how you feel about Hena's uh, and, and their, your, your Pueblo's desire to, to really hang, hang on tight to what is yours. Hamas is very traditional. Even in our language, they have Head Start programs where they teach Hamas language fluently. They don't speak no English. So my, since I'm from Hamas, I'm fluent in my own language, that's Swalatoa, and my kids, they're fluent also um, in Hamas, though we live at Seno de Fonso, and they speak Tewa. They know a little bit of Tewa, but not fluent. I try to speak a little bit of Tewa, which sometimes I'll say it wrong, but <laughs> I, you know, just to say little things in Tewa. But, um, <clears throat> The tradition that we have at Hay Mass is, um, like I said, very traditional. I try to stay with our traditional patterns. And um, I, um, like my mom has said, do everything traditional. And like, if you go to Hay Mass and See, there's a few ladies that do textiles also, but a lot of them have their own designs, and I have my own designs, which a lot of people already know my designs. Sometimes they'll say, oh, all those, I've, I've counted so many pieces of yours, because since they already know my designs. My sister is always counting when they're dancing out at Haymas. She said, Oh, I see a lot of your work. So I try to stay traditional so that it can be carried on the way I was taught. And um, like I said, share. From other pueblos, I've done a lot of classes before, and I teach the way I was taught. Um, I try to stay, um, I guess, my own way of thinking of what to put on my designs. And now, a lot of times, you see um, textiles with a lot of different colors, which, you know, it's up to that person to, to have what they want. But, like for myself, I prefer what I do to stay the way it is. And on my mantas, my kilts, most of my designs are like solid and um, with my kills, I put a lot of 
braids on the bottom, which those are finger weaved, and uh, that's part of our way of um, using our kilts at Hamas. And some places, you know, the kilts just have the borders. And it, like I have this one here, it's just a border with no braid on the bottom. So there's a lot of things that um, textiles in different pueblos, the way they use or the way they make their own. So I, um, you know, like I said, it's up to the person. Um, I don't like like to criticize, oh, that's not the way you should do it, you know. It's up to them the way they want it. But I, like for myself, I like to see my work and traditional and be carried on, you know, in the future. Um, my fear is that, you know, a lot of these younger kids don't have the, the attention there since all this uh, new technical stuff is among our Pueblo, you know, with the VCRs, their uh, phones, their all their other stuff that they're more into. They don't have the, the patience to do stuff. I always say, like when I go, why don't you have the village have their own resource? Where as I grew, as I was growing up, you know, like he said, we used to go herd our our sheep, and my older um, siblings, they used to go take care of cows, go herd the cows, and then as we were growing up, we would grind our corn on the grinding stones. There's nothing like that anymore in our villages. You can go to the museum and do things like that. But within our own Pueblo, that's what we're missing from, for our, all our younger generations. And a lot of the kids are more into uh, talking English. So as we go along, all that is going to get lost with our songs that our men um, um, sing and then how they create the songs, you know, that's going to be lost if they don't keep up their language. So I stress that, you know, even my own kids, I talk to my kids in Hamas. I have a new son-in-law. I try to talk to him in Hema, so he's learning his Tewa. <laughs> but it, you know, it takes a lot for for parents to to encourage the kids, or it should be the parents to encourage your the young ones on how to do things, even to the things where they have to do stuff in the kibas. You know, that's it takes a lot. So, but like I said, you know, my textiles, I want to be the way I was taught and show my work to other people of what I learned and to share my knowledge with other people. If they want to do what the way I do it, then it's always my pleasure to show them um, what I know about, you know, so. Thank you. And I'm going to ask one more question. I think people are running out of time here, but I uh, would like to ask the three of you um, if you could briefly offer uh, some commentary where this is concerned. So we know that these garments and the, these types of materials that um, you all create are very important to our own people. Um, and the tradition is rooted in uh, this incredible history in, in our own culture. How do you feel about Pueblo textile artistry and, uh, in, in terms of how it's perceived from the outside? Um, 
does it get the recognition that it deserves from the collector community, the museum community, and others? And then another, I guess, issue that um, I think all of you are aware of is that we have non-native people now producing the exact same thing that you're making. And when we think about all that's involved in this process, the prayer, the songs, processing materials through prayer and song to arrive at these beautiful textiles. And when a non-native person is creating the same thing and our own people are purchasing these things from those individuals, what does that say um, about where we're headed? And, and so if you could, if you don't mind just um, exp expressing your views on these. Louis? That has been one of the one of the issues that I have thought about for a long, long time, and there's one particular individual that I think we all know um, that does make moccasins, and a lot of the textiles that are on the table, on um, he makes them on a treadle loom, and then uh, his biggest clientele are all Pueblo people from all the Pueblos, and um, so for me. I, that was just jaw-dropping for me when I first met him. Um, but I think that that was um, kind of one of my big motivators when I, when I first um, started getting serious about my work. And, um, and also, not only that, non-natives or Anglos making our textiles, but also um, non-natives, Anglo people, teaching Pueblo people is one of the things that really gets me. Because, I mean, the word arrogance comes to mind. Because um, there's so much history and our people have gone through so, so much adversity to be where we're at today. And, um, and for a non-native person or non pueblo person to feel that they're qualified to teach Pueblo people, or anyone else for that matter, to do Pueblo techniques is just wrong, and um, I think should be addressed. Um, so I'm glad that, it, that it's brought up here, but uh, one of the things that I do want to say about uh, my work in particular is that I did not use monk's cloth. I weave my own cloth. I started out very first when I first started with monk's cloth, and that's how I learned to embroider on monk's cloth. And then monk's cloth just became, you know, the price kept going up and up and up per yard, and it was getting harder and harder and harder to find. And I said, this is crazy. This is for the birds. I'll just start weaving my own. That's how we're supposed to be doing it anyway. And so that's what got me started, and I struggled for a long time. It took me years to get to the point where I am, I am at now, um, growing to the point where I'm growing my own cotton from ancestral seeds, uh, spinning, going through the spinning process, ginning, working, weaving, all of the, the techniques, the brocade, the embroidery, and the floated work belts, and the spraying sashes or the braided sashes. So some of the more uh, difficult techniques, such as the brocade and the spring, um, are kind of techniques that kind of elude those non-native individuals because they're very complex. And much, many of these techniques are only taught within the cultural context of the village. And those individuals who do carry that sacred knowledge, that traditional knowledge. And so as, as public artists, we do have to be very cognizant of what we do share with the outside world um, because you know one little tip could be just that tip that they take and run with so we we have to really watch what we share with people and especially in demonstrations so i always keep things on a very um, basic level because um, there's some sharp individuals out there and um, so we need to um, 
take care of it. And as part of our nature that we have, as part of our, our culture, is humility, but also secrecy on a lot of levels, even within our own villages and even within our own you know, communities sometimes. Um, and that, has, that serves many other purposes as well, but I just do uh, want to mention that, that certain things, as far as even as simple as setting up a ward, we, you know, um, there's a lot of, it leads to a lot of other things, um, but, but uh, it is important that we do um, keep that up. Now, as far as the other piece, as far as um, like antique dealers come to mind, and I, I go to these antique shows, and these guys are, are have the brocaded sashes or a kilt out, and you know, how much are you asking for this? And they say, oh, you know, fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, look, it has some ethnographic wear. There's some even body paint on there. It was danced, like they're trying to charge for that. And I just kind of look at them and just kind of say, okay, well, you know, I have my own opinions about that, but. Um, and then I say, and then I go continue talking with them. Oh, you know, I'm a uh, couple of weaver, and I make these things, and you know, so I'm flipping through them and showing them some of my work. Oh, you, you do great work, huh? and then they say, well, how much would you give me for one of my pieces of this? Well, and they're not interested because they want the ethnographic or the old textile. They're not interested in in the in the new stuff. So I think there's kind of a disconnect there because people kind of have a tendency to romanticize the old and what was, and today it's like no more. But here we are trying as hard as we can to, to see to it that this continues to be a living part of our culture and our tradition. And um, I think that uh, the more we, we have these kind of forums to educate, the better, and uh, you know, we're just we're just getting there. We're on the cusp of a revival right now in Pueblo textiles, and I like to, you know, I like to think that I, I have played a role in that. I've worked with individuals from Hopi, Zuni, like I said, all the Pueblos to revive this tradition, and uh, I only hope in my prayers that you know this work will continue, and uh, long after we're gone. So I'll let my panelists share their perspective. <laughs> I think Lou was uh, just answer all our questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, um, in my opinion, I think, um, you know, for non-natives to be doing artwork, you know, I don't see, I don't appreciate that, you know. I don't want to see, uh, a kill made in China or you know somewhere else you know we take them taking our designs so like Louis said you know it, it's it's hard when you see other na non-natives uh, trying to take up our way of life or, or doing our some textiles or taking our designs you know, uh, but, uh, I, I really don't do weavings myself. I have done uh, embroidery on some of the Hopi woven pieces. And um, as a matter of fact, I have one of Lewis's kill, which I haven't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> but most of my work is on a moss club. So, but, you know, since I don't weave, I, I do it on those clubs that are, that are commercial, but uh, that's the only thing, you know, we can use. And I have, I have brought my mom's old manta, and I'll display it at the SAR. And, from what it's made of, you know, from a long time ago. But uh, like um, I said, you know, I didn't do, I don't do a lot of weavings myself. I did, as a little girl, I did wave um, uh, belts and then uh, white sash, but that was the only time. So 
like right now, my livelihood is doing my Pueblo embroidery. That's what I'm, I'm into right now. Thank you. Well, I think the three of us can attest to the fact that when it comes to Pueblo textiles, especially when we come to Santa Fe Indian Market or we do the herd show in Phoenix or any show in and around, we are the black sheep of the art world. Not many people know about us and there's not a huge group of collectors that do collect for Pueblo textiles. And it's um, very difficult, it's very difficult to maintain any livelihood. Um, Mr. Garcia teaches, and that's what allows him to do this. Um, you've been doing this for many years, and you've built a client base, but if it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't be able to be a full-time artist as I am, because she brings in the steady paycheck while I play with string. But when it comes to the non-natives, I, I don't go to them directly. I go to their buyers. And I tell them, do they pray for your stuff? Do they put their heart and soul into what it is? I said, they're collecting the mighty dollar. But yet, when you wear their clothing in your village, I said, whose God are you praying to then? I said, but the prayers and the hopes that we put into our textiles is what we hope to be blessed onto this world, but um, I know Santa Domingo and another village has taken a stance to the cooks. Industry, which is out in Bosque Farms, they are not allowed to sell in their village anymore, and I wish my village in Zuni would take that stance, but um, come Shalako time, they will be set up in our village trying to sell non pueblo wares, and our people are the ones that go and buy them from them. But I always tell them that's one of the reasons why we are in this huge drought. Because all the hopes and intentions that we do as Native people to ask for that rain to come is being, is being pushed aside by wearing these garments that are not blessed in the proper way. And they're not created in that special way that we do create them. But this is the challenges that we face. And we as weavers struggle for every dollar that we get and we appreciate it, but anytime we have these particular pieces in our village, we tend to display them within the main living quarters of the home. And as people come and go into our home, it's always said that you know, they bring positive energy and they bring negative energy, but these garments will attract the positive stuff to stay. And as the people leave our homes, they take the bad stuff with them. But through their visitation, in our homes, they come and talk. And they plant those seeds, those seeds of kosh, itsu manakya, kosh, kashima itsu manakya. And those seeds that they plant spiritually in our homes, they grow just as we hope our wealth would grow. Our long life, our good fortunes, and all those trials and tribulations we go through, you know, we're able to conquer those with the blessings that people bring into our homes. And, um, Non-natives can't provide that for our people. And I always challenge my people, you know, buy native, buy small. That way we can grow in that way. And we all struggle to get started and we all struggle to get where we're at. And I know we're all proud of where we are and the education that we gain and the knowledge that we bestow upon people through our teachings. But. We will continue to pray as long as we are here on this earth and hope that our children will carry this on. And yes, technology is the hugest trial that we've been struggling because I tell my boys, I say, come on, let's work on a project. And they're like, wait, let me finish this game. <laughs> but that's what we struggle with. And we hope that you know our kids will gain this knowledge and they will retain it. But as Louis said, you'll teach as many as 200 but you only gain a few that will carry it on. They'll retain that knowledge, but yet the financial portion is the reason why most of them don't carry on. And so that's our struggle as Native people, as Pueblo people, to carry this tradition on. 
And it's not easy work, it's very, very hard. And I am actually close to retiring from weaving because our pride just kicks in. I've been doing this full time for 26 years and that takes its toll. And so um, not all of us can be able to weave um, as long as we want, but you know, there are alternatives and education would be that alternative to that. So but, um, with that, I'm very humbled to be here and I'm very thankful for everybody who invited us to share with you uh, our way of life and um, it's always a life of prayer, and that's who we are as Pueblo Weavers.